Hi, I'm Greg Grant, the Smith County Horticulturist for the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And I thought in light of recent weather events, we'd visit the Tyler Botanical Garden here in Tyler, Texas, and take a look at some recent freeze damage. Uh, as all of you know, uh, people in different parts of the state got anywhere from uh, teens in the valley to single digits in central Texas to zero in north Texas and negatives in the panhandle. I know at my house I got down to 0 0.7 in East Texas. People here in Tyler and some of my master gardeners and co-workers, some of them got as low as minus 7. Um, zero is the lowest I've ever been in my life uh, as a gardener. Luckily, I'm old enough to remember the freezes of the 1980s where twice we got down to once to close to zero, if not zero, and once in single digits. And I happen to remember most of what, what died and can relate this time hopefully to what's going to make it back and what's not. But every year's different, every site's different, microclimates are different, uh, different cultivars are different, different species are different. So we're going to cover a little bit of all that today and we're going to start in the Heritage Rose Garden and take a look at how the roses fared in Tyler, Texas and hopefully in your garden as well. There's good news and it's bad news when it comes to roses. Um, we grow a lot of different types of roses here in the Tyler Rose Garden and in the Heritage Rose Garden. And I, knew, I know in you and your gardens, you grow a lot of different types of roses as well. And so there's not one standard answer that I can give you on how your roses fare. But let's look at some of the basics and let's look at some of the general classes of roses. Here you see in front of me is an old polyantha rose called the Fairy. And it's an earth kind rose. It does extremely well. But you can see uh, already which stems on here are green and which ones are turning brown. And that's what you're going to be looking at, not only on roses, but on most of your shrubs in your landscape. Luckily, we had uh, maybe 6, 8, 10, 12 inches of snow in this area, and you're going to see a lot of examples in your landscape and today where the part that was covered with snow is still green. So if you look down here, you'll see the stems on these roses are green. You see the top portion where there was air, uh, they're somewhat brown. And so in this particular plant, there's going to be marginal damage. Maybe about a fourth of it is going to be uh, damaged. But what we're going to do on all of our roses, I don't care what kind it is or what kind I'm going to show you, instead of doing your typical Valentine's Day rose pruning, which you may have already done, which is fine, but if you haven't done it, don't do it. Because what's going to determine where you prune your roses this year is how far back they froze. And so in about a month, uh, you're going to be able to see uh, what's going to grow and what's not. Maybe in a matter of a few weeks, you're going to see what froze and what's not. Because on roses, on the young stems, it's as simple. If it's green, it's alive. If it's brown, it's not. But if there's any doubt whatsoever, wait till they start to sprout. And then cut off everything that's not sprouted. Leave what's growing. So in this particular case, we're only going to cut off about a third or a quarter of the plant. Behind me, there's a, a pretty tea rose. Unfortunately, tea roses are somewhat cold sensitive. They're going to have more severe damage, and it looks like just a casual glance, and we'll look at some more a little bit later, that the only portion of those plants that's going to survive is about 6 or 10 inches at the bottom that was covered with snow. Snow is amazing. It's like an insulator. It's like a styrofoam igloo, literally. And so a lot of our plants have been saved. Uh, even though the tops may be dead, the portion that was insulated by snow is going to re-sprout, and we're going to end up cutting a lot of things back to that snow line. Now, if you didn't have a snow insulation, you might have more damage. If you're further south and didn't have as much cold, you might have not have as much damage in the plant. If you're in uh, Far East Texas, like where my farm is, uh, and there was less snow and more ice, you might have a little more damage and you might have more breakage. But that's, snow was a good thing in this particular case because it's going to help save a lot of our plants and help them to re-sprout from not only the roots but the lower stems. So let's go look at some other roses that are more cold tender, and then we'll go look at some of the roses that are more cold hardy. Unfortunately, a lot of the roses that we grow in our landscapes, including all of our roses, most of their genetics, come from tropical southeastern Asia, China, Japan, places that are mild climates that typically mimic more of the southeastern United States. So you'll see here beside me an old climbing rose, a once blooming climber called Rosa Fortuniana. It's half Lady Banksia, and so plants like Lady Banksias and Fortuniana, uh, Cherokee rose, uh, Noisette roses, teas and chinas, those are roses that historically, from the time they were discovered, they weren't able to grow in Europe and they weren't able to grow in the northern U.S. because they weren't cold hardy. And so all of these things have basically experienced what those gardeners did for decades before they learned and developed more cold hardy roses and we've begun to just grow those roses in the south. So what's going to happen? We're just going to wait and see. This is a climbing rose. It's 12 or 15 feet tall right now. 
And once it starts to sprout out, it may be 12 or 15 inches tall when we get through it. So we honestly don't know. You can scratch the stem with your pocket knife. You can look at roses. Uh, if they're bright green, they're probably okay. If they're brown, they're probably not. Right now, they're kind of in that olive stage, and we're not 100% sure. And so I can look at this one already and tell. It's probably not going to make it, but it's still greenish looking. So we're just going to let the plants tell us. But it's not that big a deal because I see down here at the base, I see some fairly bright green stems. I'm pretty sure this rose is going to spring back. And yeah, we've lost 12 or 15 feet of growth in two years of training. But you know what? That's better than losing the rose entirely. And so just be aware that some of the old-fashioned roses, some of the climbers like Lady Banks's Rosa Fortuniana, uh, Climbing Teas, the Noisette Roses, those are truly southern roses that can't take zero degrees. So we're probably going to have some pretty major damage on there. But wait till the plants start to sprout. Don't get out there. I'm not even going to waste time with my pocket knife whittling, which a lot of people are doing right now, or running out there trying to cut out the brown. I'm going to wait till the plant grows and do my cutting one time. There's no sense going out every week, taking off six inches, 12 inches, you know, two feet, three feet, when ultimately we're gonna take off 12 feet. And so to save time, I'm just gonna wait and do it when the plant tells me where to cut it back. I'm standing here in the China Bed Cemetery, excuse me, our China Rose Collection, to show you an example of a rose that loves the South, but historically was somewhat cold tender and couldn't be grown in the North. Unfortunately, we suffered major damage on China roses, which typically would be a long live, easy to grow, rarely pruned, doesn't have to be grafted, doesn't have to be sprayed, classic sort of earth kind, low maintenance, grandma's garden, antique rose. The problem is the one thing that can go wrong with them did go wrong. And so just like on the, the banks is and the tender climbing roses, we're not going to do anything to these plants till they start to sprout. Uh, somebody, if you had the queen coming to tea tomorrow and you just couldn't stand to look at it, yeah, you could go ahead and cut them to the ground, but we don't know. These are all different plants. Some of them may freeze back halfway, some of them may freeze down to one foot, and some of them may freeze down to one inch. And so I'm gonna wait till they start to sprout out and then prune them at the height that they're still alive. So just wanted to show you an example of some roses that love the South, but unfortunately uh, our ice dagger didn't particularly like them. So I think they'll all be okay and I think they'll spread back from the ground, uh, partially because of that, that snow cover. As a longtime Texas rose rustler, three of the classes of roses that like the South the most and the ones that I typically find surviving all across the South and abandoned landscapes and cemeteries happen to be teas, chinas, and polyanthas. And so one time a person was confused about which rose to order out of a catalog because there were so many different classes and I just said, remember that Polly wants all the tea in China and you'll remember the three classes of roses that like to grow here. Unfortunately, teas and chinas can be somewhat tender. As I mentioned, aren't grown in the north in, in Europe because of that. Polyanthas happen to be more cold hardy. They're part Japanese multiflora rose, which has more cold hardiness. This is a prime example right here, Marie Pavier, one of my favorites, an extremely fragrant uh, polyantha rose. But if you look, it looks like they've suffered freeze damage all the way down to the snow line, which just tells you how cold it got. So polyanthas aren't even considered a real tender rose, and yet I'm pretty sure we got freeze damage down to the ground, and we're going to have to cut these back. But once again, I'm going to wait till they re-sprout, do my pruning at one time, and you're really not going to pay attention if you happen to snip off some of that new growth. But it's just looking at casual glance because I can see it's brown here, it's olive green here, and the only bright green is down here. I just wanted to show you an example of what kind of severe cold we were talking about, because this is a rose that would almost never get cold damage in the south, but zero degrees is more than southern plants can take, and no plant likes to go from fairly warm, because we had a, a mild winter going, and so plants have to acclimate and adapt, and so you can take an otherwise cold hardy plant and freeze it by going from warm to really cold, and certainly we went to really cold. So let's go look at the uh, tea, bed, tea roses and see what other tender roses look like after that zero degree temperature. This is one of my favorite roses, an earth kind rose named Duchesse de Brabant. It's an old tea rose. It's in our tea bed here at the Heritage Rose Garden in Tyler. It was uh, purportedly Teddy Roosevelt's favorite rose, who supposedly wore one in his boutonniere, as a boutonniere rose every day. But you can see it got hit really hard by the freeze because the tea group in general, being from somewhat almost subtropical Asia, is cold tender. It's the reason why rosarians all over the U.S. and Europe used to not grow the tea roses, and it's the reason we did grow them in the south, because they love heat and humidity. But once again, it's looking like these things probably froze down to, looking at the snow line down here, about six inches. So we've got a six foot tall plant that once it starts to sprout back, it's probably going to be six inches tall, which is not a huge deal. They'll sprout back. Roses will bloom on new growth. We'll have blooms in the fall, but instead of having what looks like a, a 
five gallon plant here, it's gonna look like we've planted a one gallon plant this spring, which is better than losing the plant entirely. So I'm thinking that we're not gonna lose any roses here in the Tyler Rose Garden. Uh, maybe a few rare examples. Mostly we're gonna end up cutting things back to the ground once they sprout. I hate to beat a dead rose to death, but just to show you an example of how cold it got, this is a different class of rose. This is Souvenir de la Malmaison in the bourbon class, which is a rose that they did grow in Europe and is more cold hardy and could have been grown in the north. But once again, because we were mild and got so cold, you'll see the freeze damage on here. You may not can see it, but I can tell you, it looks to me like this is gonna be dead once again down to the snow line at about six inches tall. And that's even being in a microclimate surrounded by concrete and brick. It was just way too cold for these guys. But once again, not gonna do anything. Uh, once it starts to sprout back, uh, we'll probably go through with a pair of loppers and prune all these things back down to, to live growth, which is unfortunately going to be about ankle or knee high on a lot of these roses. When it comes to cold hardiness in plants, it's all about genetics, uh, genetics and evolution. So wherever that plant came from originally and wherever it spent thousands and even millions of years evolving with those temperatures, that's what it knows and that's what it can handle. So here's an example of a rose. It's actually an old um, Gallica type rose that I collected from Scottsville, Texas years ago from a plant that was 150 years old. It's an example of a cold hardy once blooming rose. You notice it's not evergreen and so this is a plant adapted to more cold and so it doesn't have broad leaves, it doesn't have foliage during the winter time. It suffered virtually no freeze damage and it's all about genetics. It's also a once bloomer so if it did freeze to the ground we wouldn't have any blooms but I bet you anything this plant's going to have blooms on it this year and it's not going to have any freeze damage because it's a cold hardy species. But if you look right here in front of it, you see a Louisiana iris that had winter foliage and so it suffered some freeze damage, but it's not going to die. Uh, it's probably going to go ahead and bloom. It's just going to be cosmetic. If you wanted to trim those off of there, that's fine. But notice in this same bed, we have a collection of, of pink and white, maroon and, and purple blue bonnets. They're perfectly fine. And so here we've got a native wildflower it's been here for thousands and thousands of years, and so it's adapted uh, to those Arctic blasts and those Polar Express that occasionally come down out of Canada. So everything you're looking at is basically about genetics and geography and, and evolution. And so from here, let's go visit the Shade Garden and take a look at some azaleas and some camellias and gardenias. Here in the Shade Garden at the Tyler Botanical Garden, we have a wonderful collection of camellias Japanese maples and azaleas and a lot of other fairly unusual plants uh, that tolerate shade and acidic soils here in East Texas. Of course, most of the state can't grow camellias, so a lot of people like to visit uh, our camellia collection, both here at the Tyler uh, Rose Garden and also at SFA Gardens in Nacogdoches, because we can do such a fine job with camellias. But as you see, uh, camellias, once again, like the roses, are from tropical, not tropical, but almost subtropical, southeastern Asia, China and Japan, parts of the world that don't have really cold, blistering winters. Our camellias, a couple of weeks ago, if you look on my Facebook page at Greg Grant Garden, you'll see these glorious pictures of bright, shiny, large green leaves, incredible flowers, larger than roses and pinks and reds and whites and variegated. And now, as I told somebody the other day, it looks like Pompeii. And so almost all the camellias here in the garden are frozen brown, the leaves are brown, the buds are brown, the flowers are brown. And so I know it looks horrible, but nothing in nature is ever as bad as it looks. And so most of these camellias I think are gonna be alive, but about once every you know, decade or two or three, uh, at least in Northeast Texas, the camellias suffer major freeze damage and end up freezing back and having to, to grow back again. Same thing happens on figs, it occasionally has happened on, on crepe myrtles. And so it's just part of growing camellias as we get further north in, in a more temperate zone. Now, if you're along the coast, Houston, Mobile, New Orleans, Savannah, Charleston, you rarely have freeze damage to the bushes on camellias. But if you'll see behind me here, and we've got probably you know, 30, 40, 50 uh, camellias here in this garden, maybe even more than that, almost all of them are brown and they're not very attractive, but like the roses, we're not gonna do anything until they start to re-sprout. And most of them are gonna have major damage to the stems I'm hoping it's not major damage, but I just suspect there's going to be a lot of cutting back, uh, may, maybe three feet, four feet, five feet, maybe three inches. We're not going to know until they start to grow. At that point, we'll get out saws and cut them back and let them regrow, and it'll take a year or two uh, to get back to a decent-sized shrub again. So it's just what happens in the garden world. But just remember, in nature, uh, life and death are all equally important. It happens. And so I know as gardeners, we like to keep everything alive, but realize nature designed it for 
everything that's growing, something is dying. For everything that's sprouting, something is dying. Things turn back into organic matter, so we try to keep them alive as long as possible. And I don't think these plants are dead, but we all need to realize that every plant, every person, every pet, we're all gonna die. And so occasionally it happens and we get really upset and plants are special and we spend a lot of money on it. But you know, nobody knows better than gardeners how to start over. And so no matter how bad it looks, it's never as bad as it seems. No matter how, how bad it is, we gardeners are the ones that make it better. So I don't care if it's brown or dead, we start over, we fix it, we make it look pretty. And the Smith County Master Gardeners will certainly do that here with the Camellia Collection in our shade garden at the Tyler Botanical Garden. Go team, go. Okay. Both of my parents were teachers, so I love to teach and I love to learn. And there's no better teacher than nature. And so here you'll see one of our classic camellias uh, from Asia where it doesn't get cold. And areas where it doesn't get cold in the south as a prime example, that's where you see plants with big leaves, large leaves, broadleaf evergreens, things like camellias and gardenias and sweet olives, or in our case in our native woods, you might have uh, southern magnolias, plants that have big showy green leaves. We love those in the garden world, except when it gets cold, uh, these plants were designed for cold. So the further north you go, you tend to have deciduous plants like the Japanese maples. We have a great Japanese maple collection here. They'll all be fine. Probably zero damage on the Japanese maples. So when you see a deciduous plant, that tells you it comes from a colder climate and they know to drop their leaves in the wintertime. Only a silly plant that's never seen cold would want to keep big, fat, evergreen leaves and have wintertime flowers in a cold climate. So if you see a plant with bright, big, shiny green leaves and flowers during the winter time, that tells you it comes from a mild climate and it's gonna need protection, or in this case, it's gonna need saving uh, and cutting back. So unfortunately, most of this camellia is gonna die back. It's gonna sprout back from the lower portion of the trunk. We're gonna wait and cut it back. We're not gonna to have to do anything with the Japanese maples. I predict they'll be just fine. But you'll also see a lot of genetic diversity in our camellia collections. So if you notice behind me, there's a camellia with japonica with hardly any freeze damage. There's a few camellia sasanquas here that hardly have any damage. There are camellias that it, they breed in other parts of the world, in other parts of the U.S. for cold hardiness. I know some breeding took place on camellias in New Jersey. And so there are some cold hardy types. Unfortunately, most of the big showy common types and most of the japonicas, as you can see, are not very cold hardy. But we'll deal with it and we'll make it all pretty, uh, hopefully by the next time you visit us. One thing you want to pay attention to, particularly on older camellias, older camellia japonicas, is they were grafted. So in the old days, uh, they didn't have greenhouses and mist systems and root hormones. They weren't able to grow these camellias from cuttings. And so they grow seedling camellia sasanquas. Sasanquas tend to be smaller leaves and single flowered or, or semi-double plants, easier to grow, a set a lot of seeds. So they'd grow a bunch of seedlings out. They'd take buds off camellia japonicas, bud those seedling rootstocks, and that means the root system belongs to one kind of plant uh, and the top portion of the plant is a different kind of plant. And so if you don't pay attention when they freeze back or if sprout comes from the below the graft union or the bud union in this case, the plant can gradually turn into something that you didn't want. So this is important on modern roses. It's important on things like peaches and plums. It's important on Camellia japonicas, particularly older ones uh, that were budded instead of or grafted. Uh, instead of being grown from cuttings and so here you see this garden was abandoned for quite some time and they weren't maintained and a lot of the rootstocks grew out so this plant was about 75 percent camellia sasanqua uh, with a small little single flower and small foliage which is not what it was supposed to be this is a plant that was intended to be so here you can see we cut it off with a chainsaw to try to grow back the original plant that was intended to be so be careful when you get freeze damage you might have enough freeze damage citrus is another example if it's grafted or budded that what comes back from below the graft union is not your citrus or camellia or rose or peach that you planted and so you want to pay particular attention to make sure that any suckers or sprouts that come from below the graft or bud union you'll take those off and nurse the plant back that you intended uh, from the original planting date in tyler texas we are known for azaleas and our spring azalea trail and unfortunately this year the azaleas just like the camellias and the roses and the gardenias and the sweet olives and a lot of those other uh, southeastern asian plants that take, can't take cold winters they took a major hit too so most of the azaleas here in tyler have brown foliage which brown foliage doesn't mean your plants are dead and so brown foliage just means that the foliage is probably dead now your plants may be dead but just because you're seeing a whole landscape full of brown plants that doesn't mean your plants are dead so certain temperature kills foliage uh, colder temperature kills flower buds and the colder temperature kills leaf buds and colder temperature kills new shoots and even colder temperature 
kills younger stems and even colder temperature, kills older stems and even colder temperature, kills lower stems, and then the coldest temperature where the ground freezes solid can kill crowns and root systems. And so just because your leaves are brown on any plant, I don't care if it's a live oak or a camellia or a gardenia or a rose or an azalea, it doesn't mean the plant's dead. So what we're going to look for is stem damage. And so uh, you can start scraping on it with your pruners or your knife and start seeing. I just soon not do that because if you do that for weeks and weeks, eventually your plant is just scraped all up and down. So it's just so much easier to just wait till the plant starts to grow back and the plant will tell you exactly where to cut it back to. So most of our plants I mentioned on the roses are going to freeze back to about the snow line. May happen on most azaleas, although there's a lot of different uh, genetic differences in azaleas too. But the southern indica is one of the most common, common groups here in Tyler and all over the south. It's a little more tender, has the largest flowers and the largest leaves, uh, probably had the most cold damage. But just looking at this plant, I see some green new shoots uh, coming out of the mulch at the ground there. So most people think their camellias are completely dead here in Tyler. I'm going to bet most of them aren't dead and they're all going to re-sprout from the ground or the snow line and we'll end up cutting them all back to that point. But not for a month or two until they start to grow and we know that. So it may be April or May in a lot of our shrubs before we, we know where to cut them back. So I wouldn't get out there with the chainsaw on the loppers right now. And I wouldn't even get out there with the knife and scrape it on the... And everybody's saying, well, it looks this color, it looks that color. Just wait and the plant will tell you. It's pretty... So people say, how do you know? I said, if it's brown, cut it down. If it's green, leave it be. And it's, it's pretty easy. If it has green leaves on it, and it'll be obvious. The new growth will be flushing back hard on the live plants. And if it's not, and you sit there and look at it, and it's June, July, and there's nothing left, well, then you can know your plant's dead. But I just imagine in most of the areas where we had snow, uh, that a lot of these plants, at least woody plants, are going to come back uh, from the crowns and root systems and lower stems. There's no better example of cold hardiness in the bedding plant world or the vegetable world uh, than annual plants. And so when it comes to annuals, like vegetables and flowers, some plants have plenty of built-in antifreeze in them, things like cabbage and kale and collards and Brussels sprouts. Uh, as you can see, they can actually freeze solid. Pansies are a good example too, and then thaw out and still be alive. While other plants, warm season annuals, tomatoes and peppers and uh, uh, things that we grow in the summertime garden like periwinkles and patience and begonias, they're gonna freeze and die entirely. Certainly we'd, we wouldn't have had those planted now, but you may have had things out like uh, calendulas and uh, sweet alyssum and uh, They'd be flowering tobacco, they'd be dead from the cold, but you might have had things out like pansies that weren't hurt at all. Dianthus may just have burned back. The vegetable world, maybe your onions and potatoes are, are dead. Your lettuce may or may not be dead. Your cabbage and whatnot may be just fine. So what you're really gonna have to do is replant any spring greens again. You might have to replant your onions and potatoes. You still got time. Uh, and it's obviously too early to put out things like tomatoes and peppers. And so it really doesn't change a whole lot in the annual bedding plant and the vegetable plant world. If it's alive, use it. If it's dead, pull it up and replant something else. So not that big a deal because we're used to changing out annual bedding plants and vegetable transplants maybe as much as six times a year. I've been getting a lot of questions about succulents and certainly in a dry state like Texas, we grow a lot of succulents. They make great pot plants. They make great zero escape plants. Unfortunately, in the succulent world, we have a wide range of genetics. We have everything from plants that can take, can't take any freeze at all, that would be dead outside uh, during single digits and zero degree temperatures. Others like a lot of opuntias that may be cold hardy down to the single digits. Uh, some plants like yuccas and sotols that, that may be perfectly fine. And so all you can do on succulents right now is wait. Uh, now if you want to cut off all the mush, it's fine. It's just I don't particularly like cutting mush. And so I usually wait till things like this get dry and crispy, peel away the dried, some plants are going to be completely dead. Some are going to sprout back from a stem or a little root system there. Some plants are going to lose some of their uh, their pads or their leaves, like the opuntias. Some plants, like yuccas and daisy lirons, may be perfectly fine. And so I would just wait a while, and if it's dead, cut it off. If it's completely dead, replace it. And if it's fine, you just go about life as normal. So unfortunately, it's all over the place when it comes to freeze damage on our succulents. Tyler is famous for its rose garden, supposedly the largest municipal rose garden in the United States. All kind of roses, uh, especially hybrid teas and grandiflores and floribundas and shrub roses and knockouts and drift roses, but also a, a nice collection of David Austin roses, a good collection of earth kind roses. Most of these modern roses tend to be cold hardy and they were bred uh, to be grown further north and in, in Europe. Unfortunately, they all have uh, those cold tender genes in them to give them the ever blooming trait. And so just looking at these roses, 
even though it's we're past rose pruning time here luckily they hadn't been pruned already because that pruning would have been wasted because just at first glance it appears to me that they've frozen back to where the snow line was which is unusual on roses that are typically cold hardy because I can see bright green down here at about six inches the rest of it it's olive green I see a lot of brown tips but I also see brown lesions developing all on the stems here so I just su suspect most of these roses in the rose garden in your garden are probably going to have pretty major freeze damage. Now the good news is roses bloom on new growth so once they start to sprout you can see what's alive cut them back even if it's one foot tall or one inch tall and then the growth is going to come back from that and they'll have some blooms uh, hopefully by summer and fall certainly by fall and I hate it and that's going to be a lot of work in this garden but there's, I'm sure there's a lot of work to go on in your garden as well. One of my favorite fragrances in the world comes from the sweet olive plant Actually, a small tree, a large shrub, once again native to tropical, excuse me, southeastern Asia. And so, as you can see, a lot of damage. Once again, being an evergreen plant uh, with foliage and flowers during the wintertime tells you you're set up for freeze damage. And so, I hate it, but these sweet olives and a lot of other shrubs in our landscapes are going to end up freezing back. And so, just a quick little test with my pocket knife on here showed brown under the bark, brown under the bark, brown, olive green, olive green and greener as I got closer to the base. So at just first glance, uh, just testing this plant right here, like a lot of other plants in our landscapes, probably gonna end up having to be cut back down to uh, knee high, ground level six inches, 12 inches. But once again, and I know you're tired of hearing me say it, wait till the plant re-sprouts and then cut it back to that point. And so uh, just part of life, we'll cut it back, we'll start over. And uh, it's no different than when we planted the plant, it was small to begin with. So won't get any flowers this year, but that's, that's just part of life. As I mentioned earlier, I was the county horticulturist assistant. Actually, I was the, I uh, hmm, can't even remember what my title was now, the extension assistant in horticulture? No, I was a horticultural clerk in Dallas County in 1985, uh, following a severe uh, freeze in 1984, if I remember correctly. Things get sketchy when you get older, as you know. And so for $13,333.33, I answered 100 garden questions a day on three lines in the Dallas County office. And I answered lots of questions about live oaks with the bark pop, popping off. And I would moved there in the middle of the blizzard, so I was quite familiar uh, with the freeze. And I remember our water pipes burst. And so I have all that in my mind and a lot of the common plants that froze. Well, one plant that we grow a lot of today that wasn't common back then is Laura Petalum, sometimes called Chinese fringe flower, uh, pink flowers, purplish looking leaves and lots of damage all over East Texas, more commonly grown in East Texas, but you see it in other parts of the state, all over the country right now. And so a lot of them are completely brown. And so I had a lot of question myself because it's a plant that I haven't seen go through single digits and zero degree temperatures. This one's in a fairly protected location. And even though it's kind of scrappy looking, it's already sprouting from buds all over the stems. It looks like it has no damage except leaf damage. And so once again, just because you see brown foliage doesn't tell you how damaged the plant is. So some of those plants will just literally, it's what live oaks typically do each year. Uh, they drop their entire crop of leaves when the new leaves come out and all the stems are fine. And so there may be a lot of plants that are brown now that totally leaf out, just like this little petalum is. And unfortunately, there are going to be others like the azaleas and the camellias and the gardenias and the roses that may have major damage on there. So I didn't know Laura Petalum was so cold tender. One plant I considered fairly cold tender is gold dust plant or a Cuba japonica. In my mind, I always thought a Cuba and Fatsia, which are both shade tolerant shrubs with big leaves, uh, shiny green leaves during the wintertime, grown just strictly for their foliage. I thought they were equal in cold hardness and I thought there'd be major damage on a Cuba or gold dust plant. But as you see, not even a brown speck on there, which is pretty darn amazing. And we'll take a look at some Fatsia and see quite the opposite. Fatsia japonica is one of our common evergreen shrubs that we grow in shady landscapes. Great big shiny green leaves, which tells you they're probably not terribly cold tolerant. As I mentioned, I thought they were similar in cold hardiness to Cuba, and I expected major damage on both. We did get fairly major damage on Fatsia. This could be an example of one of those plants that some of them are going to have just foliage damage. This one, the foliage was just melted and mush and hanging there and it looked so unattractive the master gardeners went through and pruned off the foliage. Left all the stems because I'm not sure at this point these stems may be okay. They may sprout from the existing buds, they may sprout from the middle of the plant or they may sprout from the ground but we're going to wait till they come back just like our other shrubs before we cut them back. Of course there was a lot of talk about protecting plants and covering plants and greenhouses and frost cloth and plastic and light bulbs and all the typical things we talk about. 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, frost cloth and plastic and blankets and sheets uh, didn't cut it with a lot of plants during this freeze. So the reason they call frost cloth frost cloth is it gives you probably six or eight degrees of, of protection, uh, for, can protect you from a major frost. So here's an example of, of a rare species, Camellia, Camellia irioides. And we have lots of unusual Camellias here in our uh, shade garden at the Tyler Botanical Garden. So it was covered with frost cloth. And as you see, what we got was frozen frost cloth and frozen Camellia. And so what we needed uh, was Arctic blast cloth and greenhouses and heat and your warm body snuggled up against it. And so unfortunately, uh, frost cloth and plastic and blankets and that sort of thing only buys you a few degrees of protection. And when you have a cold, that cold, you really need heat provided in there and something totally sealed up. So I know lots of you have plenty of examples of things that you covered and didn't cover and things that you heated and you didn't heat. And we've got uh, sort of a smorgasbord of, of plants that survived based on what kind of protection that you gave. And we gardeners like to share that information. Just remember frost cloth is it's just that frost cloth, not terrible freeze cloth. We grow a lot of live oaks in Texas, Perkins, Virginiana. Uh, but one thing you have to realize, live oaks were originally native as a coastal tree all along the Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, uh, Florida coast. And so any tree that's spreading and has evergreen leaves throughout the wintertime, uh, it's not gonna be terribly cold hardy. And so I remember back in the 80s, we actually had bad damage on live oaks in the Dallas area. So time's only gonna tell how much damage we have on these live oaks. Now, everybody's excited right now about the brown leaves on their live oak trees because they look horrible. We realize that live oak foliage only lasts one year no matter what kind of winter you have. So in a bad winter, uh, that foliage can freeze early and fall off. Uh, typically, it doesn't come off until the new buds push them off. And so just because your oak tree, your live oak tree is brown right now, doesn't mean it's dead. What's really going to be important is whether we had stem damage on there. And you know what? These particular trees in the uh, Tyler Botanical Garden look like they probably had some damage on this new growth because it's olive green colored. But once again, you're not going to know until it sprouts out. But don't worry about the foliage because that was going to fall off anyway. Right next to it is a red oak tree that's deciduous, and so when you see a deciduous oak tree, that, or any deciduous plant, that tells you it comes from a northern climate where it's smart enough to not try to keep foliage during the winter time. When you see evergreen plants, particularly that have large leaves, uh, like magnolias or even live oaks, that tells you they came from a coastal climate where you don't have bad winters. So you just got to wait and see on the live oaks to see what kind of damage we have on the stem. Don't worry about the brown leaves, they're gonna come off anyway. In East Texas, we have a lot of pine trees, including loblolly pine that you see here. We have shortleaf pine in Northeast Texas, loblolly in the deep East Texas piney woods, and we have some longleaf pine in Southeast Texas. Uh, some people this year, after a hard freeze, have pine trees that are turning brown like this, and of course, they get pretty excited about it. I'm pretty sure we're not gonna have any freeze damage on the pine. This is just gonna be damage on the needles. Those needles are gonna fall off. I suspect the stems are gonna be fine. The buds are gonna be fine. Uh, I know it doesn't look pretty right now, but I don't think we're gonna have major damage in our East Texas pine forest. Because these are plants that evolved here for over thousands of years, and they've seen uh, Arctic blast and Polar Express before. And I think they're gonna be fine. They just happen to have foliage and needles that got desiccated by the cold uh, weather. I may have oversimplified things making you think that plants are either going to be dead or alive at a certain height. And a lot of plants, that's going to be the case. I think that's the way roses and a lot of plants are going to work. But some plants aren't going to be that simple. So here's a case of a rare dogwood, Cornus wilsoniana from China. And it's got portions of dead tissue scattered all over it, like bruises at almost every node and patches. Here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. So plants like this are going to have this slow, painful, ugly dieback. So one branch is going to be alive. This one's going to be a part alive. This bud's going to sprout out and then wither, and so it's going to be this ugly kind of death, and you're just going to have to keep cutting off the dead. It may end up dying back to the ground. It may lose five stems and retain three. It may have one stem that's five feet tall, one three, one two, and the rest of the shoots coming from the ground. And so some of your plants, you're literally just going to have to wait and see what comes back. And if a portion dies, you cut it out. If it's alive, you leave it. And so it may not be as simple as cutting it back to the ground. So they're happy that it's going to live. We grow a lot of tropicals in Texas, we grow a lot of perennials in Texas, and we grow a lot of subtropical perennials in Texas. So some of our perennials are cold hardy way up north, and some of our perennials are things that are only perennial in Texas and the coast and, the, and south. Cannas are a good example. Uh, three of my favorite 
uh, plants for the South, our favorite heirloom plants happen to be in the three C's, cannas and crinums and crepe myrtles. Well, cannas are a prime example of a plant that's not terribly cold hardy. In the North, they have to dig them and store them because the rhizomes freeze under the ground. And so we almost always lose the foliage and stems on cannas. And so we would typically cut this back um, at the first freeze, certainly by the time it sprouts. Most of our cannas are, are almost always root hardy here, sprout back from the rhizomes. Unfortunately, this is a rare one, Canna aritiflora emania, uh, that uh, I worked really hard to get. It's one we should have protected and we didn't. And so all of this top portion, just like it was an elephant ear or some other uh, tropical plant, we're going to cut back and we're going to hope that something sprouts back from the base here. I don't know if it will or not. I used to grow some of these to sell uh, when I had a little bulb farm and I lost an entire row one year uh, to cold. So this is a plant that doesn't like to stay in the ground during the winter time and it doesn't like to be stored during the winter time, which is one reason it's rare in commerce. Uh, it's a beautiful canna. It looks like a cross between a banana and a fuchsia. Unfortunately, this looks, may look like a rotted banana or banana pudding when we get through with it all. And so it's a good example of one that should have been protected or even dug up and stored. And so hopefully some of mine at home that I covered will make it. So cannas are a great perennial, but they're not very cold hardy. Cut it all back, wait and see what sprouts in the springtime. And it may be just a piece of the plant, but all it takes is a little piece of a canna or a lot of perennials that have rhizomes uh, to end up growing a healthy plant back. So let's go take a look at some crinums and see what they look like. Crinums or crinum lilies are an example of a sort of a subtropical perennial that we grow here in the south. They're actually an amaryllis family, have great big underground bulbs, sometimes as large as a football even. The top of the foliage dies almost every year if you have any winter at all, and so it's not uncommon common for them to turn to mush. And so as you see, my master gardener's already got a hold of this clump of crinum lilies here. It's a milk and wine crinum with striped flowers. Uh, it's known for being cold hardy. Any portion under the ground is going to come back, so I don't think we're going to have any death on the crinums that make bulbs. Now there are some tropical crinums like crinum asiaticum, the kind that make trunks and don't make underground bulbs. So almost all of our bulbs, even if they look terrible, spider lilies, oxblood lilies, narcissus, jonquils, daffodils, tropical bulbs like crinums and gingers, even though they look terrible, any portion that's under the ground is probably going to come back. The worst thing that can happen on your spring and fall bulbs is you might have a, a sparse bloom or even no bloom next year. The crinum lilies are going to be just fine. You're not going to know any difference at all because the foliage is supposed to freeze off. Most of the cannas are going to make it except for a few rare types. So I don't think we're going to have to worry about uh, crinum lilies. They've been doing their thing for 100 years or so. But somebody said the other day, you said no crinum lily ever died. Uh, and they were talking about the foliage. I said, well, crinum lily foliage always dies in the winter. And the only thing that can kill a crinum, and I always point that out to people, is cold temperatures. So if you get anywhere further north than about Oklahoma, crinums will freeze and die. And of course, we got close to those kind of temperatures here this year. But if you'll notice, this particular crinum, it's already made one inch of growth here in the last week or so. And so warm temperatures is bringing this out. And what's important on most bulbs is not the bulb, not the foliage, not even the flower. It's the basal plate down at the root base, that's the portion of a bulb that can make new shoots and new roots. So as long as that portion survives and the ground didn't freeze all the way that low, we certainly aren't going to lose things like crinum lilies. Crape myrtles are the one, one of the most common shrubs or small trees or sometimes even medium-sized trees uh, here in East Texas. Um, actually considered uh, by law, I think, the state shrub of Texas, although most of our crape myrtles happen to be trees, if they're not pruned off or Great murdered as they call it. And so lots of examples uh, all over the south of what crepe myrtles can do and cannot do based on size and height and cold hardiness. Typical crepe myrtles are cold hardy all over the south, all the way up to at least Dallas, Oklahoma. But a zero degree temperature, I know in the 80s it froze plants like Lagostromia faria, the Japanese crepe myrtle, my Natchez crepe myrtles froze to the ground in zero degrees during the 80s. So some of the hybrids may have major freeze damage. Some of the indica types got no freeze damage in the 80s. Some of the indica types froze to the ground in the 80s. So what I'm saying is we're gonna have freeze damage all over the place with crepe myrtles. We just wait till they start to grow. They may have no damage. You may cut them back at 10 feet. They may freeze to the ground. And so whatever point they start to grow, and I hate it, but you're just gonna to have to cut them back to that point. So no matter how big and pretty it is, if the top is dead and shoots are coming up from the ground, you'll cut it off at the ground and they'll flush back in no time at all. They're all gonna be root hardy. I'd be really surprised unless it's a really small crepe myrtle or a crepe myrtle in a pot. It's rare that a crepe myrtle dies uh, entirely. 
but you could lose trunks, you could lose branches. Several times in the last decade or so, I've had some branch damage, and we've had branch damage uh, within the last year or two uh, here in Tyler and in the Dallas area with crepe myrtles. So we just got to wait and see. Crepe myrtles like warm temperatures and warm nights, and so whatever part grows, you leave, and whatever part is dead, you're gonna cut out of there. Hopefully you hadn't butchered them regularly. Plants, the crepe myrtles that are topped all the time are actually less cold hardy uh, than plants that are unpruned. And so there may be some crepe myrtles that are barely clinging to life that do freeze. And of course, we've had some crepe myrtle bark scale issues all over the south. Hopefully some of that crepe myrtle bark scale froze and died as well. So hopefully crepe myrtles will be fine, but if not, we're gonna cut them back and, and grow them back again. I love my spring bulbs and I was about a week away from having a grand show at my farm and then the hard freeze hit and because our bulbs do their main show in February, of course when we have a terrible freeze in February, it did ugly things to my bulbs and everybody's bulbs. So just a little bit of genetics on the cold hardiness of some bulbs. First of all, because they're bulbs and because they store up energy underground, almost all of them are going to be alive and fine. There are a few tropical bulbs. Most of our long time perennial heirloom bulbs will be fine. Uh, they're going to produce more foliage. Uh, they may not bloom as well next year. Some of them may bloom just the same. So they've been doing this uh, sort of thing here for at least 100 years. Some of them, like the Campanile Jonquil here, it's been around for about 400 years. And so in the daffodil world, uh, in the Narcissus genus, we have everything from cold tender plants. Once again, it's all about genetics. So here you see Narcissus tazetta is from the Mediterranean. It didn't evolve with cold temperatures. It grows during the winter time. Things like paper whites, Narcissus italicus, in this case, um, uh, avalanche of gold and Grand Primo Narcissus. All those things were in full leaf and full flower. So of course they don't do very good uh, when it turns zero degrees. Uh, jonquils are from Spain and Portugal and, and France. Somewhat uh, milder temperatures, but not as mild as the Mediterranean. And so they have marginal damage. Uh, Campanelles seem to have popped back fairly fine. A lot of the jonquil hybrids have got some damage. Straight Narcissus jonquilla has pretty good damage on it. But then you'll also see uh, daffodils, Narcissus, pseudo Narcissus. They're from Europe, and so they evolved with colder climates. So you see the wide blue gray leaves. Here you see it's a, a ice follies daffodil. They're going to bloom like nothing happened. And so things like daffodils and tulips come from colder climates, have less damage. Things like Narcissus come from milder climates and they have major damage, but they're all going to be fine and they'll all be back uh, for future years. So don't worry too much about your bulbs, even though you missed your big show this year. And so nothing's ever guaranteed in life of the, of the gardening world and there's, uh, there's always next year.